uh, they're tucked in the back of the Old Testament. Uh, they're usually short, uh, but sometimes it's those who have uh, um, uh, lesser voices that truly might uh, have much to say. Uh, so uh, that's the case frequently with the Minor Prophets, so we're going to look at them uh, today. We're going to look at one especially uh, called Hosea. I don't know the last time any of you has read Hosea, and uh, maybe I'll let uh, Jeff unmute you for a moment and say, when's the last time somebody's looked at Hosea? I actually looked at it a few weeks ago, and I thought, oh, what, what's the big deal about this? I guess I, <laughs> I really didn't get much out of it. Okay. Did not have any background knowledge about okay. it. That's fine. We'll try and provide a little background knowledge, and then uh, <laughs> look at a few key verses. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at uh, Hosea now. Maybe we can mute each other. We'll, I'll break uh, periodically for us all to talk. Uh, Minor prophets with a major message. Yep, yeah. right in the back of the Old Testament, after the law, after the writings, then we come to the major prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and then we come uh, to the minor prophets, one of whom is Hosea. It's the first of the minor prophets, uh, as is found uh, just in our canonical order. Now, when you're reading uh, Old Testament uh, prophets, they're, you know, we're reading something that we're just not used to seeing frequently. Uh, it, we're reading a genre that is not a modern genre. It's, it's an ancient one. So we've just got to be aware of how we need to read the prophets. We need to read them in light of what the Old Testament has said earlier, particularly the law. And if you remember the law, that's Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. But then uh, other events that take place within uh, uh, the Old Testament will also have a bearing. So uh, the more of the Old Testament that you know and the more that you're familiar with, the likely the more uh, easily you'll be able to look uh, and grasp things out of a book like uh, Hosea. Look for images. The prophets are filled with images. Uh, some of them are very striking, and we're going to really work with one uh, very striking and upsetting image uh, today, uh, that of harlotry and um, uh, Hosea and uh, him marrying a harlot. We'll see. That's, that's hard to work with. Then remember to uh, look for some correspondence with the New Testament. Uh, that will come up at times. And then remember that uh, the prophets were written during the time of the kings. And some kings were good kings, other kings were bad kings. What was going on at the time when the prophets were being written? That's always a helpful thing to have in mind. So we'll look at that too. Good. Uh, let's see, I've largely spoken about this already. There are some gems in the minor prophets. We're gonna look at a few of them today. And they do have some powerful words for us as well. So here's some important background for us as we read through Hosea. Who is this man, Hosea? Well, he's a son of a man named Beeri. We don't know too much about him, but he belonged to the upper class, the upper class in the land of Israel. Some of the uh, prophets uh, are not upper class. Some of the prophets uh, have uh, uh, other uh, backgrounds and callings uh, uh, besides this, but we don't know as much about uh, Hosea. We do know that he's an elegant writer and he wrote uh, in Hebrew. The, the prophet of Hosea is spe specifically gonna call God's people back to, uh, to the Lord, um, and he is going to encourage them to have a true heartfelt um, affection uh, for the Lord. And that certainly is an idea that is valuable in today's time. He's going to marry somebody, he's going to marry Gomer, and Gomer uh, is the daughter of uh, Diblaim, and she is a prostitute. She is a harlot. Um, and you might think, well, how could the Lord do that? Uh, well, the prophets had some very difficult lives. Um, it might sound uh, glamorous uh, to be a prophet or a son of a prophet. Uh, some of you might know that expression, I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet. Uh, but the prophets in the Old Testament, uh, these people lived uh, some very difficult lives. Uh, uh, Jeremiah, the, the prophet of lamentation, a sad, sad uh, uh, writing that he has to do, as well as experience uh, himself. Isaiah is martyred, he's sawn in two. I mean, this is just some of numerous stories about uh, the prophets and how, uh, how uh, difficult it was uh, to be a prophet, but they carried the Lord's message 
in their time. Now, Hosea, as well as Gomer, are going to have uh, two sons. Uh, one of them is going to be called uh, Yezreel, which means God sows. But the other one's going to be called Loami, which means not my people, literally in Hebrew. Lo, the word for not, and Ami meaning, um, well, Am being people and me uh, being my people. So uh, the uh, children that are going to come from uh, Gomer and Hosea, God sows, as well as not my people. And then they're also going to have a daughter, uh, Lo Ruhama, meaning the unpitied one. Uh, I don't know how you named your children. I think of uh, how we named our children, and we did think of the meaning behind each of the names. Um, uh, Abigail, uh, my father's joy. Uh, Samuel, uh, the Lord hears. Henry uh, is a family name that uh, comes uh, through our family, but actually <laughs> Henry means ruler of the house. Well, we should have rethought that uh, at times. But anyway, uh, each of the names had a significance um, as uh, not only as, whether it be a family name or whether it be a meaning of uh, uh, how uh, a spiritual meaning uh, to, uh, to each of the children. I never would have thought about naming uh, uh, any of my children by these names, not my people or the unpitied one. Um, but that's what Homer, uh, what Hosea and Gomer are going to have in their family lineage. He's writing in about uh, 740 BC. Uh, this is right before the time of exile, where Israel is going to be taken into exile in 722 BC. And just reading uh, the very first verse of uh, Hosea, we read these words. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. Who are the kings? Uh, well, here are uh, just a little bit of background about a few of them. Israel is the northern kingdom of Israel. You'll know that, you know, some of you may know that uh, Israel and Judah separated uh, right after the time of Solomon. There were two brothers, uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. They didn't get along and they split. Um, Israel becoming the northern kingdom, Judah becoming the southern kingdom. And it's Hosea that's going to prophesy to the northern kingdom. And here's about one of the kings. His name is Jeroboam II. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittiah, the prophet which was of Gathheper. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. Yeah, that sounds rather bleak, uh, but that's uh, uh, probably better than some of the kings uh, during that time. Um, uh, Jotham, Ahaz, these, these uh, kings were not uh, uh, the most pleasant. There are some uh, good kings in the time of Hosea, but most of the time uh, Hosea is prophesying at the time where uh, the kings were not so good at all. Jeroboam II does lead into economic prosperity, but uh, with economic prosperity came idolatry, and also with idols came spiritual trouble. So uh, here's a picture of one of the idols uh, on the side, uh, Baal, Asherah, um, then sacred prostitution became part of the land. Uh, that's not a good thing. And the Israelites uh, began to be led astray to believe that uh, other gods would provide life's blessings. One other threat that uh, the Israelites had was a man named Tiglath Pileser. I bet uh, some of you have never heard that name before. He was an Assyrian king uh, from, uh, who uh, was a ruler of the Assyrians, and uh, he was eventually going to come and take over uh, the uh, nation of Israel. Uh, it's a bleak time in the time of, um, of the Northern Kingdom. Several of these kings that we mentioned uh, had uh, ascended to the throne, several became, uh, uh, were killed, and uh, Israel was looking around, what should it do uh, with uh, the threats of Tiglath-Pileser? What should it do uh, to hold off 
uh, this other empire taking them over. Good. Any comments or thoughts somebody wants to have about the background of um, Hosea before we start reading some more texts from uh, this minor prophet? So, yes. so God told Hosea the names to, to call his children? Yes. Right? And um, were, were those children killed then? Or... Um, no, I don't. Th they're, they were, they're used as illustrations. I mean, they are uh, legitimate. Uh, uh, they're legitimate I mean, these, children. Okay, so these were these were real people, and it. Uh, I I guess I, I'm I'm trying to understand why God would, um, would would single out these children, um, and have them identified in a negative way right from the get go. Uh, and I probably can only give a partial answer to that. <laughs> uh, who has known the mind of the Lord uh, uh, is, 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 is part of this. Um, uh, but I think it also fits in with the prophetic calling. Um, uh, God, God had promised that he would send uh, prophets uh, to uh, guide and care for Israel. And uh, he does this to draw them back to the law and the, the covenant that, uh, that uh, he had made with them uh, years and years ago. Um, so it's frequent that the prophets uh, live out the uh, problems of, uh, of God's people. It's a very, very hard calling. The only thing you see where they're talking about making alliances with Assyria and with Egypt, you see all the things where the uh, uh, Jews are ignoring the fact that they should have faith in God. Yeah. They're trying to find uh, security elsewhere. And that's, of course, part of the problem that they have. Definitely. Okay, we're going to go on and do some reading then of some texts. Let's just read some texts uh, out of the book of Hosea. Reading first, Hosea 1, 2, 3, 3. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the, the daughter of Diblaim, and she uh, conceived and bore him a son. So here we have uh, you know, the Lord specifically speaking, the specific calling uh, to take a wife of whoredom. Why? Because the land creates great whoredom, as the prophet's life then resembles what is happening in uh, the life of uh, God's people. Keep reading. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. When she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. One last verse from chapter one, and the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint for themselves one head and they shall go up from the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Okay, what's happening here? Um, Hosea called to a sad uh, situation in his family, specifically to be a voice uh, for the Lord. Let's just think about uh, this verse, verse nine, uh, call his name, not my people for you are not my people, I am not your God. There's so many times that this promise comes up over and over in the Old Testament. I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and I shall dwell in your midst. That's a theme that runs well throughout the scripture, even culminating in the book of Revelation. But you can see how bad things have gotten here. They will be not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. But then you can see that God hasn't fully forgotten his people from verse 10. For the number of the, uh, the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured. But at this point in time, 
the ways that uh, the people of Israel are acting are not uh, in accordance and not uh, in, in, in line with uh, how they should be as the people of God. God will never forget his people, but sometimes they act in such a way as, as if not his people. That's going to have uh, some thoughts uh, for us to ruminate uh, uh, about uh, the current situation uh, that, that we're living in in the Western world. Spiritual adultery in the Lord. God and Israel have been uh, seen throughout uh, sections of the Old Testament to be like husband and wife. I will be your God and you will be my people. But when Israel uh, pushes aside God's love and mocks it and takes on for itself um, other idols to take that place, that then leads to the Lord's great heartache. So we keep now reading in Hosea, now reading Hosea 2, verses 1 through 3. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. Lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Reading further, I thought I came across this picture. I thought it was sort of interesting, uh, uh, the way that uh, you can have uh, uh, the believer, or in this case, Israel, holding hands with the world and, um, you know, truly looking at uh, somebody else uh, to provide uh, uh, love, nurture, and attention, while the Lord himself, uh, Christ uh, as uh, our husband uh, of the church, uh, uh, wanting to love us and love us more. Verse 6 of Hosea 2, Therefore I will hedge up, hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but not, and shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me than now. Hmm. Interesting judgment, right? How uh, the people of Israel wanting to hold uh, somebody else's hand, wanting to find somebody else's attention, the Lord lets them go. And then after they've looked for that other attention, then again, she uh, uh, will return, is the promise, at least from verse 7. And she did not know that I, it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time, and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Maybe you have some uh, comment or thought here on uh, Hosea 2. Um, it's an interesting way that the Lord expresses his judgment uh, to um, God's people. He lets them go. And then as they are let go, hmm, and they then see, oh, it was better with the Lord. And then they return. Any uh, comments or thoughts on this? Isn't this, I mean, this is like a prophecy of what's going to happen to them, right? I mean, it's surely oh, yes. going to be invaded. Yeah, and they will be invaded, yes. This is about 20 years or so before the invasion. And then, of course, God's people will go away into exile, and then they will come back again, and that'll be at the time of uh, Nehemiah and Ezra uh, as they rebuild uh, the temple. And then there's a, a time of a little bit of a, of, of a uh, revival. You know, frequently we think about God's judgment and we think of uh, you know, maybe hellfire and brimstone preachers uh, uh, thinking of cataclysmic uh, judgment, but this is an interesting way to express it, isn't it? Uh, you want to find uh, your uh, meaning in something. Uh, uh, the Lord then lets the people go and then they decide, oh, maybe we mm -hmm. should look somewhere else and return. Yeah, Any thoughts or comments on that? Isn't it sort of like... Uh... We had 9-11, and now we have the coronavirus, and we've had other scary times in history, and it always seems to bring some people back. But the fact of the matter is, as they get away from that scary time, they tend to wonder again. And I think that's really sort of what's happening here or what the forecast is, right? Well, I think that's, that's definitely where I'm going with, uh, uh, with this. Uh, uh, and... I'm hoping at least to, to at least illustrate that uh, the Lord has a way of letting people go and calling them back. Uh, and, 
and that we should be looking for him to to call us back uh, during as we come to the future. There's also a lack of knowledge happening at the time of uh, Hosea's uh, writing. Uh, God's people were searching for other idols. Now uh, uh, we read in Hosea 4 that they seem to lack a basic knowledge of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a, has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. It's more of the same, isn't it? Uh, uh, people seem to lack knowledge, and well, then the Lord then withholds knowledge. Uh, they uh, 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 have forgotten the law. Okay, well, I'm going to forget you as well. Um, but God will buy, buy back Israel. And we see this repeatedly throughout uh, Hosea as while he is letting them go on the one hand, then he is also trying to bring them back as God is uh, active in trying to reclaim his people. Now here, Hosea 3. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. I don't know if any of you like raisins cakes. Uh, that's an ancient uh, uh, dish. Uh, uh, but anyway, they're, they're loving other things. Uh, and now uh, the Lord still is wanting to love them. Verse 2. So I bought, bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. Of Israel shall dwell many days without king or priest, with the prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. This is reciprocity going on, letting them go, but then the Lord pulling them back. Hosea 11, uh, verses 8 through 9. How can I give up? Uh, give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. So on the one hand, he lets them go. On the other hand, he wishes to bring them back. So great is the compassion of our loving Lord. What other text in uh, Hosea um, with an invitation to return to the Lord? Uh, Hosea 6, verses 1 through 3. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Sounds like uh, the resurrection, doesn't it, right? Uh, two days down, then he will bring us back. And then this lovely verse from Hosea 6.3. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn, and he will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. I know several of you have been to uh, the promised land, uh, the holy land, the land of Israel. I have not. But I have been in a desert situation and uh, living out in Southern California for a little while, um, uh, some uh, 30 years ago. There is nothing like uh, a nice, cool shower in the desert, right? Let's not think of this uh, in uh, cold and uh, wet uh, April here in uh, Southeast Pennsylvania. Let's think of uh, desert climbs. There's nothing like having a 100 degree day and then along comes a nice shower that freshens the earth, uh, that uh, washes away uh, the heat uh, and the dust. Uh, think of it in that way. Let us know, let us press on to the name of the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. The dawn always comes. There's always a light on the horizon. 
at least uh, each morning as we wake up and as we think of the Lord himself. For he will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water, in this case, the desert earth. What period of time are we talking here that the people realize, let us return to the Lord? Was it like hundreds of years, that short time, or... This is uh, 740 or so BC, right before, uh, 20 years before uh, the exile. So, so there will be a minor return, but then it's going to go downhill and they're going to be in exile. The okay, so when they're saying this, let us return, a lot of time has elapsed or not? Um, okay, uh, well, since from the day the heydays of uh, david and then solomon oh uh, there's there's been a need to return to the lord uh, have there been uh, times when uh, the the kingdom has been strong definitely uh, the time of king david the time of uh, of solomon and then several other kings uh, in uh, uh, in israel were strong too but for every one of them, there were probably two to three bad kings and in the time of hosea uh, we were in the time of, of some bad kings, uh, uh, though Hezekiah uh, was uh, seen as a good, a good king. Well, I'm, j I'm just thinking present day, you know, how long will it take us to realize that we need the Lord? How, you know, how, how long will God put up with, with some of the things that are going on? That, that's a, a really uh, filled question of which uh, <laughs> Hosea doesn't give us a direct answer on that. Um, and nor will we, do we know, but if, if we're in the, the spot where we're wondering how long will the Lord uh, uh, put up with it, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a reasonable question. Hmm. He won't put up with it forever. No. And we're going to try and apply this more to the coronavirus in a moment, but uh, you know, here we have a, a global activity that has happened to us, which <clears throat> most didn't see coming. Um, will it get worse? Is this a precursor to the end? Um, uh, there will certainly be an end, but when will that be? Um, mm -hmm. We don't know. Right. But in the meanwhile, uh, the Lord uh, letting people run their own way, then trying to bring them back to himself. Uh, Hosea does speak to that today, that we're not in a, a deistic situation where the Lord is just sort of stepped back and he's washing his hands and just letting uh, uh, the world uh, uh, take its own course. Um, and Hosea has nothing about... Uh, uh, oh, God's people, they'll be, they, they can go their own way and do their own thing without him wanting to reach out again and pull, pull God's people to himself, even though they are showing, or we are showing at times, uh, uh, interest in other things. Hosea does speak to that, a very active God with a very uh, deep uh, heart compassion to bring people to himself. I have a comment, Drake. One of the, you're talking about the desert and the rain and what happens yep. with the desert and the rain. One of the most fascinating things that happens in Namibia, and I think it's, I'm sure it's other places where you have possibly gone six, eight, nine months of practically no rain whatsoever. You've got a heavy rain and all of a sudden, incredibly, the desert bursts forth with all these flowers. You'll thought, where the heck have these things have been? They haven't been there. And mm -hmm. suddenly they come out with this rain. And this is a, and I just wonder if this is sort of part of the picture here of, of God coming back and all of these people sort of bursting forth and whatever. Uh, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a very good, interesting phenomenon to see the desert, be, well, like a desert with nothing there but sand and all of a sudden heavy rain and wow, all these flowers, where'd they come from? Right. They were there all along. <laughs> Precisely, and, and, and I think that's, that's the picture here. Even in the middle of uh, judgment, the potential that the desert will break forth into flower is, is great. One final plea to return. Now, this is uh, Hosea chapter 14. So we've seen this uh, interwoven uh, judgment, letting the people go, uh, the heartache that, uh, uh, that comes from uh, uh, you're to be my people, but now you're not my people. Now, once again, Hosea uh, has ideas of, or, or puts forward the plea to return uh, to, to the Lord. 
Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, accept what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. Remember Assyria, that was the, uh, the nation uh, to the north that was going to uh, come and invade them. That's uh, Tiglath-Pileser, right? Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, and we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands, and you, the orphan, finds mercy. I will hear their, heal their apostasy, as now uh, God's people have turned from idolatry. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and his fragrance like Lebanon. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O oh, Ephraim, another word for Israel, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble. Okay, let's uh, try and apply this a little bit to the time of uh, this uh, uh, pandemic that we're, that we're in. And we've only looked at several verses from Hosea, and there's more. Uh, that we could look at, but we've looked at a pattern. We've seen that there's a pattern, and I want to apply this pattern at least to the time of the coronavirus and, and then uh, have us think particularly about how some Anglican bishops um, have given us a few quotes that uh, have uh, traveled through the internet, and I'd be interested in your thoughts uh, on what they've said. The pattern is God, uh, God's people have been spiritually interested in other things. Hmm. They have a lack of knowledge. And then the ever-seeking God comes and reaches out, asking for his people once again uh, to come back to him. Now, I think we see this in the West right now, uh, where God's people find themselves spiritually interested in other things, uh, as uh, the church uh, has been decreasing in a secular uh, world in which we're living right now. It's interesting that that also corresponds to a lack of knowledge of God. Uh, uh, biblical literacy continues to decrease in the West. Uh, it is increasing in other places uh, in the world, uh, but it is decreasing here in the West. But is our ever-seeking God, is he always looking after us? I would say from the pattern of Hosea, yes, he is. Now, this is one bishop who uh, came up with one very provocative comment. He is uh, a, uh, the bishop of the uh, Indian Ocean, um, and he is an Anglican bishop uh, within the Anglican Church. And I thought I'd read you this quotation. I'll let you comment, and then uh, I'll read one other quotation from another Anglican bishop who uh, countered uh, him a little bit. So, but anyway, uh, this was provocative. I heard it a couple weeks ago. James, uh, Bishop James Wong says, in three short months, just like he did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything we worship. God said, you want to worship athletes? I'll shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I will shut, shut down civic centers. You want to worship actors? I will shut down theaters. You want to worship money? I will shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want me to go, you don't want to go to church and worship me? I will make it where you can't go to church. I imagine he could have mentioned others. You want to worship health? I will empty your gyms and fill your hospitals. You want to worship recreation? I will close the Magic Kingdom and gate your parks. You want to worship travel and exotic places? I will dock your cruise liners and ground your planes. You want to indulge in the nightlife? I will close your restaurants and bars and shutter your cities. Maybe you have some thoughts on that quote. Very provocative quote. I was going to say, when you think about it, so much of the stuff, I mean, you hear about the, the booming stock market and there's been prosperity for such a long t period of time. People just take everything for granted and assume that it's going to be ongoing better and better. 
and just uh, ignoring everything else that's uh, really important. And uh, yeah. I think everything is ground to a halt. And I think that uh, even when you see the uh, closing of churches and all, you never imagined that would be happening. Yes. Well, I think it's pretty, pretty apparent in the world. So many people think that they have gotten where they are financially or educationally on their own merit and uh, have failed to recognize that it's only that God has given us these things. And I think that this virus and all the inconveniences that, that we are experiencing certainly demonstrate that we are not independent, that, that we are not doing things because we, we have done it on our own. God has given us everything. And I, yes. I, I think that's the major takeaway that I, that I see. Any th thought about uh, God even closing down the church? You don't want to go to church? I'll make it so you can't. That, that fits the Hosea pattern. Right? You don't want to come to church? Okay. But at the same time, there's also the hope because we've got things like Zoom. Well, there we go. We always have hope. Um, but I think that the parallel here with uh, Hosea of, you want to run your own way? Okay, go ahead. We're going to read one more quote uh, from an Anglican bishop, and he's going to just adjust this a little bit. Um, and I'll be curious as to your thoughts on this. This is uh, Bishop Mark, Mark Lawrence. He's a bishop in uh, South Carolina, I believe. And he comments on uh, the previous quote. He says, I'm inclined to say it is a judgment upon our idols. It reveals to us how frail, can, how frail life can be and how vain at times are pursuits. God is the source of our lives, of our health. It is God's creation that gives us the food we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. Whether it's the work we yearn to get back to, the sports we miss, the recreation or travel we are presently denied, it is God who is the source of it all. One of the things I think is interesting, and I don't know where they got the statistics, it's liable to be from something like Amazon, that during this period of time, the uh, number of uh, Bibles being uh, purchased just went off the, off the charts. I don't have any detail, but this goes back to seeing the thing about people returning to what's important rather than all the things that they were previously preoccupied with. Yes. I'd be interested in the, uh, any stat you have there, Bill, on, on the purchase of Bibles. Uh, I just heard an anecdotal one. I, unfortunately, there was no reference that I found yet. I'll be interested to see what happens in our society when uh, we get back to life uh, uh, as more normal, or will it ever be uh, normal again? Uh, the many pleasures that we enjoy, uh, have they, uh, they've all been given to us uh, by the Lord's hand, and he certainly is uh, uh, challenging us on what is the source of them. We used to sing this hymn in Scotland, and it's got a, there's a link that we have on the, on the uh, PowerPoint. I wonder if we could listen to it. I'm going to try. It's uh, based on Hosea 6 uh, and Hosea 6.3, Come let us to the Lord our God with contrite hearts uh, return. It's about a four-minute hymn. Maybe as you listen to this, or hopefully you can listen to it, maybe we'd use it as a... a as a thought and as a, as a prayer for our nation, as well as uh, for uh, the Christian church, that during this time we would be brought back, uh, brought back uh, to uh, the Lord our God.
enjoyed the lyrics to that hymn that speak of uh, if we return, if we seek the Lord, we will, uh, uh, he will return to us. And that is the hope uh, during this time of coronavirus that uh, uh, not only uh, will the nation, but also uh, even uh, the broader Christian church, once again, return to the Lord. He is looking, he is active, he is seeking, and uh, uh, Lord willing, he will find us even through this time of pandemic. I'm going to close uh, now with a word of prayer. Thank you for bearing with us uh, on the technology today. We hope we'll have a few more bugs out. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, our Father, for this day. We thank you that uh, you are with us uh, in all things. But as our nation uh, deals with this uh, pandemic, uh, we pray, Lord, uh, for your grace. We pray that we would put aside our idols. We pray that we would once again seek uh, you as being our source and uh, being our comfort and our help. And we pray for our church especially, uh, particularly for maybe members uh, who have lapsed and uh, have uh, strayed from you, Lord. Uh, we pray that uh, they might find their way back to you. Help them, Lord. Uh, help them to find the way, to find their way back to you and to uh, be renewed in heart and in soul. And Lord, bless us now as we go our separate ways and encourage us uh, in the rest of the week. We look to you as being our good and loving Lord. And we ask you these things today in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Next week, uh, Dr. McKinley will be along to once again give uh, a major word from a minor prophet. Uh, the small prophet will be the book of Habakkuk. It's only three chapters, so if you want to read uh, Habakkuk before then, that'll be the subject for next time. <laughs>